Let's take our Bibles again and open them this morning to the book of Genesis chapter 18, if you will, please. We're actually going to start out in chapter 18 in a moment. We'll be going to chapter 22 for the main part of the message. Genesis chapter 18. I want to focus your attention on basically one thought this morning in this chapter. But let me just say that in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham and Sarah are visited by messengers of God. They come with a message of God's mercy and grace and goodness. A reminder again that Abraham and Sarah will have a son. They also come with a message of God's judgment, particularly dealing with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But it is in the midst of these messages, verse number 19, that an amazing statement is made about Abraham. When you look at this verse with me, please, God has promised a son. We come to verse 19, For I know him, the Lord says, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Note that phrase, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. I want to speak to you on that subject this morning. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Father, I thank you today for the privilege of looking into the Word of God and learning that which will help us as people, as families, as a church, to be what God wants us to be. Lord, help me now as I speak. Use the message today. Let it be a blessing. And we'll thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It did not take me long after I became a dad to learn a simple thing that really impacted me as a father. It was this simple thought. As I watched my children, even at the very earliest age, I figured out that they liked what I liked. They wanted to do what I wanted to do. They were interested in the things that I was interested in. I think back over some of the activities that, that my boys and I have enjoyed together. I think back of some of the hunting equipment or camping equipment that we each had one of the same thing. You know, it just became more and more obvious as the kids were growing up that, as kids so often do, oh, I realize there may be a rare exception, but as kids so often do, what matters to Dad mattered to them. What's interesting that in the passage of Scripture we've read this morning, God speaks of Abraham and simply says that Abraham is going to be the kind of a dad, the kind of a, a father, the kind of a leader to his home that will not only teach his family, command his family the way of the Lord, but they're going to keep it. Several chapters later, Genesis chapter 22, we have an amazing story that I believe is a powerful presentation of what God talked about even before Isaac had been born. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 2, if, I'm sorry, 22, if you will, please. And I'd like to begin reading this story this morning and then we're going to identify three things that were part of keeping the way of the Lord in the life of this man and his family. 
Genesis chapter 22, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt. Now let me pause briefly for sake of explanation and say that the word tempt here as it was put into the scripture thousands of years ago means to prove, to test. It's the same as Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 20 where the scripture says that God was going to prove his people. Let me say this, there are times in life when God enrolls us in courses in the school of life, we weren't planning to take that semester, but then he always gives a test. Why do we give a test? To see if we're learning anything. Alright? What is God doing? He's going to try to teach Abraham something, but he's going to give him a test to see if he learned it. Is that clear? Let's keep reading. The Lord did tempt, or test or prove Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Again, let me pause to make a simple note for us dads. Listening dads are good dads. It's important to listen when God has something to say. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, Get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. You say, what? Yeah, that's what he said. Now, folks, I've got to tell you right about now, there's something that, to me as a dad, automatically makes me a little uncomfortable. Yes, God said, Abraham, take this son, I'm going to tell you where to go, and I'm going to tell you what to do there. You are to sacrifice him to me as an offering. Can I just show you a little secret? You and I don't relate well to the sacrificial system, but I can tell you this much, sacrifices didn't lead me all to the life, Okay? Let's continue reading. Verse 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. Only because I'm a dad and have been a dad, I'm already getting caught up in the spirit of this thing. I can almost picture Abraham as this older, or might we even say elderly man that he was, probably to us more of a grandfather type being. We know that he was a hundred years old at this point in his life when Isaac was born, and now this is several years later. I see this little boy at his side, and I can just see this little guy bouncing with excitement. Dad's going to let me carry the wood? Dad's got fire. Dad's taken his knife. Even the servants don't get to go, but I do. We're going up in the mountain, and we're going to build something, and we're going to burn something. What boy would have thought this was about to be the neatest thing he'd ever done? But you know, it's about this point that the test begins. And there are three things that we're going to see in the life of Abraham that are very critical. Number one, I want you to see his faith in God. Let's look, if we will, back at the scripture, verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. Did I already mention that dads need to be listening? I think I did. 
They need to listen when God has something to say, but they better be listening when their kids have something to say. I get a little worried about some of these dads who think that their kids ought to be seen and not heard. But one of the best things we can do, dads, is listen. I talk to some dads who now wish they could talk to their kids, but their kids don't have anything to say because their kids have concluded he didn't listen to me when I tried to talk to him. Why would I try to talk to him now? I've met some men who in later years of their lives are very burdened, very saddened because their kids just don't want to talk. He was your dad. He was listening. Notice what he said. And he, speaking of Isaac, said, Behold the fire. Dad, you're carrying that. And the wood, I'm carrying that. But Dad, something's missing. Isaac didn't know a lot about offering sacrifices, but he did know you had to have a sacrifice. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? I don't know about you men, but I suspect that right about now it was as if a dagger just hit Abraham right in the chest. It was like a fish just pounded him right in the stomach and knocked the wind out of him. Why? He knows where the sacrifice is. He knows who the lamb is. He knows who's going to die today because God has told him to do it. You know something? In the next verse, Abraham makes a statement that in a powerful way displays his faith in God. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. What an incredible statement. Did Abraham really know? No, that he flat on the tree, he hadn't read the book of Genesis yet. <laughs> no, he hadn't got a copy of the script before the release date. No, in all truthfulness, at this moment when Abraham made that statement, he knew what God had said, he knew what he was to do, but he didn't know how it was going to work out, but he was going to trust God no matter what. You know something? Human beings, we who are human beings, are creatures of self, are we not? Sure, I can take a step if I know where I'm going to put my foot. Sure, I'll make a move if I know where it's going to take me or how it's going to turn out. Sometimes faith involves things we can't see. A number of years ago, we were out in Illinois and our family got invited to a Sunday school class picnic. And we were out in the country at the Sunday school teacher's home and it was just a big activity night, a lot of games and things for the families, and a big cookout, and I think I was a bit of devotional, and they did an activity that evening that, to be honest with you, was kind of neat. It was for the couples, and here's what they had done. They had sort of laid out a horseshoe-shaped track. They had marked it out with balloons, and, uh, they had a garden tractor, they had a starting line and a finish line, and hooked to the garden tractor was a, a car, a wagon. In the wagon there was a lawn chair. And here's what the contest was going to be. The husband had to get on the tractor, and they would put on the blindfold. His wife would get in the wagon and sit in the lawn chair, and she was to talk him through that horseshoe track, uh, track to see how fast you could do it without getting any balloons. Hey, what do we know about good husbands? They listen to their wives and they do what they're told. So, I mean, this is going to be a great contest. You know, that's the first day men do that. We're going to finally get 
get to some of the crawl, we're going to get you, all right? So they came to us and they're like, come on, you got to do this thing. Yeah. And uh, so we went out there and we got on the tractor and they started it up for us and put my blindfold on, my wife climbed in the car and the whistle blew and it's like, go! And I started to move that thing forward. You know what? It was fun. Driving blindly was fun. You want to know why? Because someone could see and was telling me where to go and it was working. You know how good it was working? I reached down, grabbed the throttle on that track and shoved that thing as far as it would go. I mean, we blew through that course. We never touched a balloon. We got to the other end. They called our time. We had beat everybody by a long shot. And then, those lousy rent schools disqualified us because one of the rules they hadn't told us was you couldn't touch the throttle. I'm thinking, we just beat all these lousy married couples that don't communicate well, that don't get along, that don't work together. We just whooped them all and we got disqualified. Hey, it's only a game. The point I'm asking is this. You can't see, you have one option. Believe the one who can. And you know what? If you believe the one who can and you do what they tell you, you get through the course. You won't get penalized for running over balloons. It'll work great. Do you know what Abraham is doing as he's walking up that mountain with that little boy in his, hand, his side holding his hand? There's a real sense in which this is as far as he could see. But when the question was put to him, all he could say was, God will tell us what to do. God will show us what to do, and by faith I believe even when I cannot see. Let me tell you something, that's not always easy to do. But that's what walking by faith is. How many of you ever read the story of the children of Israel crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land? What picture did you have in your mind? You probably have this picture of a very gradual beach with sand or gravel and then the, the edge of the water is this shallow water an inch or two deep and it gradually works out into deeper and deeper and deeper and maybe in your mind you picture those priests with the Ark of the Covenant leading God's people and they just stepped into an inch of water and then three inches of water and then five inches of water and they just kept going and all of a sudden. One of the most surprising things is when I saw a fish in the Jordan River. You know what I found out? One got wide. Like if you see pictures of the Jordan River a lot of places, it's no wider than this room is long. But I'll tell you a couple things about it. It's fast flowing. It doesn't just trickle along. Can I tell you something else? There's no little gradual. No, we're talking about this. There was not a chance in the world for those priests who were the two up front carrying the ark to stand there and go, <laughs> dip their big toe in the water to see if God meant it, to see if God was going to come through. No, those guys with that ark on their back and on their shoulders had to literally step over the edge, the point of get it, no return. Once they went, they were going. They had to do so believing that what God said would be true when their feet hit the water and would part and God would open a way right through the river. Folks, I don't know about you, there are times in my life I've had to take some of those steps. I was pretty sure I knew what God had said and I was real sure I knew what I was to do. But in all honesty, 
I wasn't real sure what was going to happen when my foot came down. Other than the fact that I was living by faith. Daddy, we got everything that I want in. What are we going to do? God was all provide. Let's move on. Total dependence upon God. That's what we see in Abraham. Not only do we see his faith in God, continue on, and in verse 9, we're going to be, secondly, made aware of his friendship with God. Abraham's friendship with God. Verse 8 concluded by telling us they both of them went together. Verse 9, they came to the place which God had told him of. Now look at this. And Abraham built an altar there. Folks, not only do we not relate well to the sacrificial system, most of us don't really relate to the concept of an altar. But Abraham did. Are you aware of the fact that between Genesis 12 and Genesis 22, we have five recorded accounts of Abraham at an altar. Matthew Henry put it this way, wherever God put his tent, Abraham put an altar. You want to know why? Because altars represented a place of meeting with God. You go through these altars, chapter 12, a time of change. Chapter 12, a time of concern, there's a famine. Chapter 13, a time of choice, which land will we take? Uh, chapter 14, a time of conflict, Lot has been captured. Chapter 22, a time of challenge, he's being tested by God. Every time Abraham came to a critical move in his life. He built an altar and met with God. Can I just pause for a minute and say, where do you turn in those times of testing in your life? Typically, we go back to the places that got us where we are with God. Abraham was going to meet with God. He knew how to commune with God. Chapter 12 and verse 8, it is all recalled on the name of the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 4, he called on the name of the Lord. This altar was person to person. This altar was one on one. This is where this man became what he really was. Smith will remember from the family rally, I used an illustration in my message of a a South African pastor who I heard preaching one time on a recording. Don't know the man. I've heard him preach a number of times. He was describing an incident from his childhood. Company had come for a meal. The families are gathered around the table. They've been visiting after the meal. Suddenly this man said, Hey, God stood up pushed his chair in, excused himself from the table, and he looked at his company and said, you have to understand, this is the time when I meet with God. He said, my wife and children will be here to visit, but if I miss my time with God, I'm not the man I need to be. He walked out of the room. This preacher said his mother blushed with embarrassment. He said all the kids kind of squirmed a little bit with embarrassment. Dad had been kind of out of the ordinary. But he went on and he said, through the years, my dad did that kind of thing over and over again. He said, I learned from my dad that my dad understood that he could not be the man of God he needed to be if he missed his time with God. And then that South African preacher got very, very serious. And in that beautiful accent, he made this statement. The devil cannot touch you if you're faithful to your quiet time. Huh? 
Abraham is facing the greatest challenge, the greatest test, the most difficult time in his life. He has waited all these years. God has given him this little boy. And now he's preparing an altar for God, knowing that in a couple minutes he's going to slay his son on that altar. Where did he go? Back to the one thing that got him through, his closeness, his communion, his communication with God. There's a third thing that stands out about Abraham. Yes, his faith in God. Yes, his friendship with God. But thirdly, his fear of God. Go back to verse number 9, if you will, please. The altar has been prepared. They laid the wood in order. He bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Folks, I just try and use my imagination a little bit. Can you see Isaac gathering rocks and stones? Maybe finding ones that are too big for him to carry, but he asked Abraham, get this from that. This one will fit real good. And the time of his life. That bundle of wood is taken and stacked. How do you boys build a campfire? Well, by the way, your dad taught you to. And so good old Isaac, he's just having the time of his life getting that wood all stacked so that it's going to be a neat burning fire. Man, this is exciting, you know, Isaac is thinking. <laughs> but I want you today in your mind's eye, your imagination, to picture the scene. It's finally, Abraham does what he knows he's got to do. I'm just imagining, but maybe he gets down on his knees. Maybe he puts his hand out. He says, I just... Come here a minute. Hey, Dad, what are you going to do now? What's next? Can I, can I light the fire? Well, a boy comes over, maybe he takes his hands and he puts them on his arms and he holds them close in front of him and says, Son... I need to tell you that God has asked me to sacrifice. You know, sometimes one of the greatest tests of your commitment to God what in the world is going to go off. Think about this for a moment. You are willing to give something to God, He'll never have to take it from you. What you'll let God have that reveals what you're all about. Son, you are the most precious thing I have. But God wants me to let go of you today. To give you up. Dad, I don't know about you, but man, I get a lump in my throat thinking about it. I'm not my stomach. Maybe Abraham's temples were throbbing. Maybe there was sweat coming out on his brow. Maybe he started to tremble. Maybe his blood pressure is skyrocketing. I don't doubt for a minute he threw his arms around that old boy and held him close and a husband. I love you, son. I love you. I love you. I love you. Then the, you know what the Bible says? He took a rope. I don't know whether it was his belt. I don't know whether he brought a little coil of rope. But can you see that picture of Abraham? Says, all right, son. I want you to turn around and put your hands behind your back. Remember, Abraham hasn't read the script for this Bible story, okay? So he turned around. He takes that rope and he binds him with it. I don't doubt at this point the tears are falling freely down his face as he reaches down and he puts a hand behind his boy's legs and a hand behind his shoulder and he picks him up and even as he does, he envisions that first time when that little infant boy had been held in his arms and all the love was built up inside. 
Fleischen Sie morgen auf. Verse number 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. I don't know about you dads and you boys, but knives are a big deal in our family. If you don't know what to buy for Christmas or birthday, you are always safe with another knife. <laughs> there, there was an old old guy in Mississippi years ago who told my boy a boy that doesn't have a knife in his pocket needs to go put on a dress. <laughs> that became part of the philosophy of life that my boy grew up. But man, knives are hit. Can you imagine as Abraham reaches into his belt and pulls that knife from its sheath and maybe his hands trembling? As he raises that knife above his son. Maybe the muscles in his arm are just beginning to tense as he gets ready to do what he's got to do when suddenly the angel of the Lord called to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Dad, what have we said? Learn to listen to God. Learn to listen to your son. Well, she was good he was listening. Sure is good he wasn't preoccupied and missed the signal. angel speaks, Hear my God. He said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from thee. There's a sense in which God himself looked on this sea and went, Hey, what? Abraham? You have just passed the greatest test of your life. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind them a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Can you imagine this? Don't do it, Abraham. He passed the test. Put that knife away. Suddenly he looks. I look over there in the thicket. Now just be, use your magic. Can you get this picture? Here's the eye. He's still bound. He's laying on up. Where is it, Dad? Where is it? Where is it? Boy, he's lifted off the altar. He's set free. Come on, Dad. Let's go get him. And father and son go and take of God's provision and they come back and that animal is slain as a token of worship. And father and son together meet with God. Every other time it was Abraham and God. This time it's Abraham and Isaac and God. The proof of Abraham's fear of God was his willingness to do whatever God had asked him to do. Faith in God, friendship with God, fear of God. Folks, there's something else that I think we need to highlight this morning. You boys and girls, listen very closely to what I'm going to say. You teenagers, listen closely to what I'm going to say. You know, we could talk about, wow, what a great man Abraham was. You know, there's a sense in which not only did Abraham pass the test, but he died. Not only did Abraham get an A plus, so did I. You know, I know that. You know why I've reached that conclusion? Because I see this boy, though it's never said directly in his heart, responding, if this is what God said to my dad, it's good enough for me. You know, when you think about it, this may seem a little funny, but this little chap could have run that old man all over that mountaintop. 
When Abraham said, it's time to tie you up, there's some little boys that would have said, no, nah, you're right, Dad. You want me to catch me. And the old man could have been huffing and puffing, trying to catch it or get ripping and tearing. When he finally got a hold of it, it could have been a full-blown wrestling match. We don't see any of that, do we? No, we see Isaac. Total cooperation, because if this is what's good for Dad, it's good for me. You know, there's a very real sense in which, at this moment, Isaac became the living fulfillment of what we read in chapter 18. He will command his children and his household, and what? They. Who? The children. The household will keep the way of the Lord. Oh, no doubt about it. Abraham kept the way of the Lord, but so did Isaac. What a beautiful testimony. An old man and a little boy who both kept the way of the Lord. Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes and let's sit and be quiet before the Lord for a moment. not an issue today of whether you're a parent or a child or a teenager. No, that's not an issue at this moment. What is an issue is this. Three great things that are part of keeping the way of the Lord. Number one, faith in God. Number two, friendship with God. Number three, fear of God. I wonder today as you've listened to those three how many of us would say, Brother Tom, if I'm going to keep the way of the Lord, at least one, maybe two, maybe all three, but at least one of those areas is an area that I need to change in my life. No one's looking, it's just us here. Let's be honest with God. If that be true today, would you just lift your hand? At least one of those three. Faith in God, friendship with God, or fear of God. It needs to change. Could I see your hand? Yeah, a lot of us. You may put them down. But so I wonder if you could just go to the piano, if you would, please, and just quietly play a hymn of invitation. And here's what I'd like to suggest. God spoke in your heart this morning in one of these areas. You want to keep the way of the Lord. Could I challenge you just in this closing moment of this service to maybe just turn and kneel there at your seat? You and God go person to person, one on one for a moment. God, I want to keep the way of the Lord. I want to do it your way, but here's the area I'm going to need your help. Tell me what the need is. Ask you for the help that you need. You just do that quietly right there where you're. Right, we wait just for a moment here at the end of this service.